Friends, we have here once again a marvelous and magnificent expression of the depth, creativity, power of Holy Scripture. Some of you may remember this as a story, children and the children coloring it, got the milk version. I'm going to give you the meat version if that's okay. The real deep teaching that is here. This is why all the masters across the centuries have said we must read Holy Scripture as Lectio Divina in a prayerful state, in a certain kind of state where Holy Spirit can in fact inspire our understanding. We cannot read it like a magazine or a newspaper or an academic treatise. We then lose the power that is there. Let me show you. We have this fellow Zacchaeus and we're told he's a tax collector. Now that's different than an IRS agent, although that could fit the picture too. The idea is that Jesus is painting an image, a paradigm of someone who is truly godless. Because in those days, the tax collectors worked for the Romans, oppressed their own people. As I've told you before, a better word might be collaborators. Perhaps the most hateful word in the French language, collaborators with the Nazis. And this was Jericho, which was the entry point of all, all the trade coming from the east, from Persia, China, etc. And he was the chief tax collector, so he got a piece of the action from everybody. He was really rich, really powerful, really godless. Everybody hated him. So that's the figure that's being painted here. A godless, selfish, mean-spirited man only interested in getting you money. Now it wouldn't matter to us what happened in the first century, would it? In Jericho on a particular day, unless we understand clearly that this is a teaching that is timeless and universal for us right now. Here is an individual rejected by the religious community who cannot approach even the temple because his life is so ungodly. What we need to do is recognize in that character something of ourselves. Because every one of us has an ungodly element. And any spouse will tell you, push the wrong button and see what happens. Have the wrong circumstance, discover what happens. Have you seen the changes in the face? Delightful one day and demonic the next. We know what the human condition is. We know what our condition is. Jesus wants to paint an image that relates to the dark side of us. But for some strange reason, this hateful, godless, unreligious man wants to see Jesus. Why would that be? He doesn't go to temple. He doesn't care if he's breaking all the laws of Moses, of his people. He doesn't care if he's betraying his people. If he's thought of as low as a murderer, a prostitute, he's just happy to have power. And yet he wants to see Jesus. That's a teaching telling us that every human being deep inside, no matter how buried it is, yearns for connection with spirit, whether we know it or not. I hope everybody here knows it. I hope you folks here, when you sing those songs, know it is coming out of you. I hope when you hear those songs, when you pray, when you're in need, you find that yearning. Maybe some of you have had it for many years. That inexplicable hunger to connect with that which you can't put words around. With that which is our true home, our true identity. 
That's translated into the code word he wanted to see, Jesus. Why Jesus? The religion of his people had been rejected. That tells you right there there was something totally different about the holy man from Nazareth. There was something so different from all the other holy men and rabbis that even the totally lost and rejected people, as unreligious as you could get, knew there was something about him. Sensed that there was something about this one that was radically different. Sensed that somehow, in spite of themselves, this one manifested a love that was unconditional. Now listen. And listen from that place that has guilt, that has remorse, that has sin, that has ignorance. Understand that the incarnation of Christ is to reveal to each of us that we are loved and accepted in spite of ourselves. Isn't it true that in our case, to be accepted, if you've done something wrong, you have to say, I'm sorry first, and then we'll forgive you. Right? That's the standard procedure. But with the Holy One, you are accepted before you say you're sorry. And when you realize how you are accepted in spite of yourself, that's when your heart melts. Don't you see? That's when your humanity truly breaks open. How many times have I told you my favorite example? I don't want to do it again because I'm sure somebody will remember it. But I use it all the time with people out there who feel that they cannot be forgiven. That magnificent moment in Les Miserables, when Jean Valjean, by the way, the musical did a very bad job of showing this scene, this hateful, bitter man in prison unjustly, just trying to steal a piece of bread for his hungry family, 19 years in the galleys. No one wants him to come near them. He had, can't find a place to sleep until somebody says, knock at that door. Do you remember what happens? The priest lets him in. That night he steals his silver. The next day the police catch him. What happens is brought back to the priest and he's going back for good now. He's done. And the priest says, my friend, you forgot the candlesticks. And he gives him the silver candlesticks and the police have to let him go. And in that moment, that bitter, hateful man melts and weeps like a baby in the face of the mercy of God. This is a paradigm that the great Victor Hugo gives us that couldn't be more powerful. Transformation in the face of mercy. And that's a story for all of us, that's this story. So we find this man who is so unlikely to connect with Jesus. We were told he was short. And because he was short, he couldn't see past the crowd. That's another wonderful poetic metaphor. Just like the blind one who can't see, and so many others. It's not that he was vertically challenged. It's that something in him kept him from being able to connect with Jesus. Something in you keeps you from connecting with spirit. And in this story, we're told he was short. So he had to do something to be able to see the Holy One. Am I ringing any bells? Can you see where in yourself you are unable to connect with spirit because of hubris? Because of guilt? because of lack of self-valuation, who knows? Because of criminality, not here, but in some cases. So, in his inability to see the holy, he has to do what? He has to fight his way to the crowd. We've heard this before, with the woman in the blood, remember? The 12 years of bleeding. You have to fight 
your way through the obstacles in order to see what there is to see in the Holy One. Understand that most of those obstacles are not, a, not an outside crowd, it's an inside crowd. It's all those things within you that are in the way of getting to the Spirit. Have you seen the crowd inside? Do you know there's a crowd inside? None of us are unified, even though that's the path we are seeking. And so we have to make that will effort to get past all those pieces of ourselves that block us away from the Christ. And he is so eager to do this. He has such hunger for connection with the Holy in spite of everything that he runs. And I've told you this before, with apologies to all you joggers, in the Middle East that was considered very undignified. You do not see Middle Easterners in their robes running. And even more, you don't see them climbing trees. So he was this man with authority and power and jewels, and probably really overweight because he's eating very well, climbing a tree. Not afraid of humiliating himself, not afraid of humbling himself, not afraid of what others will say. That's a teaching. That's a spiritual set of instructions. You must not be afraid of humbling yourself in order to see Jesus. Do you see that? Do you see that that sycamore tree story is a powerful methodology to connect with spirit? Let that sink in. Are you willing to humble yourself enough to be mocked by others, to break through the crowd, to climb a tree, just so you can have a glimpse of the Holy? Can you get past your ego? Can you get past others, people's opinions, especially in this day and age? And so he does it. He makes that effort, which means we have to make that effort. And what happens? Jesus comes by. Another teaching. You ready for another teaching? He says Zacchaeus. Nobody told him his name. He didn't ask his disciples. He didn't say, who are you? He knows who he is. He knows who you are. The Holy One knows your name. Intimately, you are known. In the midst of whatever unhappiness and difficulty you are having, this teaching says you are known by the Holy One intimately. The Holy One knows your name. That alone can save you from despair, from desperation and loneliness. You are known. And Jesus goes on to another teaching. Come down, for I must dine with you tonight. The Greek is dei for must, which means it is necessary for me to dine with you. What is that saying? This is a God-appointed moment for all time. This event in Jericho, this moment is for all people in all time to understand something from God. It is necessary. It wasn't happenstance. It wasn't a good day. It was God appointed so that in 2013, we're still talking about it because there's something to learn deep within. So Jesus shows God's mercy to this hated man. And what happens? Another big teaching. All who saw it grumbled. Think about that. They grumbled at the goodness of God. How often are we guilty, especially in church when we're so self-righteous? How often do we grumble? Not that person. Not that kind of person. We only want that kind of person. What a sin it is to grumble against the mercy of God. Let us not be guilty of that. Word of the Savior, friends. Very powerful. They all grumbled. 
in their sorry, pathetic, human ways because God is good to those who don't deserve it. None of us deserve it, and God is good. And so he goes to his house, and I want you to understand that to dine with him in his house doesn't mean to have a nice meal prepared and fill your tummy. It means to commune together, to be together, because Jesus doesn't just enter his home, he enters his heart. He doesn't tell him what to do, what he should do. Out of that gratitude for being accepted in spite of himself, this man says, I'll give half my possessions to the poor. This man so greedy, so materialistic. And if I've defrauded anyone, and you can be sure he has, I'll give back. And this is interesting historically. The Hebrews had a rabbinical teaching where if you defrauded, you give back what you owe, plus 20%, he's going to give back 400%. What does that mean? His heart is so full, so changed as a human being, that he, in abundance, in generosity, wants to do good. And Jesus has not asked him a thing. I am so happy to be here to worship that I'm going to keep this place going. That there's something worthwhile here. It should be out of the abundance of our love of God and need for God. Because we have changed hearts. We have tasted the reality of God in our lives. And so Jesus says salvation has come to this household. Not just to this man with a changed heart. But to all those he is with. All those he influences. And then these final words of greatest importance. Here is the mission statement of mission statements. For the Son of Man has come to seek out and save the lost. There's a lot of theologies out there. I advise you to think on this one. Seek out those that you wouldn't imagine would have anything to do with holy things or religious things. Those who are lost in our culture, in our human ways, in the mistakes and wounds of life, seek them out and save them. And of course, friends, the truth is we are all lost. We are all in need of being found. And this teaching tells us that whoever we are, Christ is looking for you to save the lost to make your life whole, to give you that happiness that transcends all the tragedies of life. That is the true purpose of Christ's incarnation, to give us the means and the ways to live in joy in life and beyond.